Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, GDPR Five Months On. In today's webinar, we will look through the impact of GDPR on your payroll processing, highlighting the biggest areas of concern, including emailing payslips and your legal, legal obligations with regards to payroll, HR and employment law. We've already completed a sound check with people who logged on early, so we're just going to go straight into the webinar now. Today's webinar is CPD accredited and you can benefit from 1.5 CPD hours. If you would like a CPD certificate, please fill in the survey at the end of today's webinar and we will email out the CPD certificates within the next week or two. At the end of the webinar, we will have a Q&A session. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the questions bar on your control panel and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will automatically send you a copy of the recording along with the slides in a follow-up email. A short survey will also appear after you've closed down the webinar and it, we'd ask that you take a minute to fill it out in order for us to improve our webinars going forward. Just a quick look at the presenters today then. Uh, there's myself, Rachel Hines, and I work with marketing here at Bright Pay and I'll be joined by Jenny Hussey, who is the Employment Law Advisor and Payroll Specialist with Thesaurus. Morning. So now I'll pass, sorry, here's the agenda for today's webinar. And as you can see, we do have a lot to get through. So we are just going to go straight into the webinar. So I'm gonna pass you over to Jenny now to begin the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about GDPR. It has been a very topical issue for 2018. So what we're going to do is just take a quick look at some of the basic concepts of GDPR before we get into um, GDPR from a payroll processing perspective. So first and foremost, what is it? Um, GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation, which came into effect on the 25th of May this year. Um, it was European Privacy Regulation that replaced all existing um, data protection regulations, and it is an extremely significant piece of legislation and is changing how the personal data has been managed. Um, the ultimate object objective really of the G GDPR is to provide better protection for personal data. Um, the new regulation was certainly well overdue as the previous legislation that we did have there was really outdated and certainly didn't suit our current social media and internet based daily lives. Um, the security or the lack of security around personal data has become a nearly daily item on the newsreels from you know, data breaches with 87 million Facebook users to the breach of 1.2 million Dixon's car phone customers there only in June of this year. So it certainly is a very, very important um, piece of legislation. So the first thing we want to look at then is what is personal data? So the definition of personal data is any information related to a natural person or data subject that can be used to directly or indirectly identify that person. So that can be anything from a name, an address, uh, social web network websites, even a computer IP address. And, and really that list is not exhaustive. So do you hold any of that type of information in your company? Well, of course you do. Whether it's going to be your clients, your customers, your employees, Somewhere along the line, you're going to be dealing with personal data and therefore the GDPR is going to apply to you um, and your company and you really do need to be aware of the particulars of it. So under the GDPR legislation, we have six principles of data legislation. So personal data should be processed lawfully, fairly and in a transparent manner. It needs to be collected for the specific, explicit and legitimate purposes and not further processed in a manner that is incompatible with the original purposes. It needs to be adequate, relevant and limited to what is necessary in relation to those purposes. It has to be accurate and where necessary, kept up to date. Every reasonable step must be taken to ensure that personal data that is incorrect is erased or rectified without delay. It has to be kept in a form which permits identification of data subjects for no longer than what is necessary. So your, your retention periods of, of personal data there. And it has to be processed in a manner that ensures appropriate security of personal data, including the protection against unauthorized or unlawful processing. Really, the overarching principle is that of accountability. You need to be able to demonstrate compliance with these prin principles. So therefore, it's an increased burden of proof on the data controllers. But we'll look at that a little further on. 
So what's different with GDPR? We've ran a number of, of GDPR webinars earlier in the year where we do look at the ins and outs of GDPR in a lot more detail. Um, they're recorded and can be found in the support section of the BrightPay website. But today what we're looking at is um, just a few of the points regarding you know, what's different between GDPR compared to previous data protection legislation. Um, so accountability, you need to be able to demonstrate compliance. Um, transparency so you know any information you need to provide information before you actually start processing any personal data there's new mandatory breach reporting rules and um, with information that we need to cover in relation to a data protection officer there's obviously fines which we'll touch on again and um, there's new strengthened consent obligations and um, there's new and existing data subject rights which we'll take a look at some of those as well and um, so we'll look at these kind of differences now individually. The first one being demonstrating accountability. So Article 24.1 of the GDPR regulation states, the controller shall implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure and to be able to demonstrate the processing is performed in accordance with the regulation. So these measures could be, you know, a simple thing of putting an inventory of all your data together. Um, you know, that's going to be a big step in helping your company becoming accountable Um, you know, kind of putting together a list of, of what data you hold and, and kind of going through how you can make it more secure um, in that regard. If necessary to complete a data protection impact assessment. So the GDPR requires formal data protection impact assessments in relation to higher risk process, processing activities. So as a data controller, if you propose to carry out new processing, um, and if that processing is, is going to result in high risk to an individual, you will be required to conduct a DPIA. Um, you know, and high risk processing would be the likes of processing on a large scale or, or systematic basis. Um, you know, special categories or sensitive data that you might be processing. And then finally, whether or not you, you need to appoint a data protection officer. So this is a new role under GDPR. Um, and the main role of the DPO is going to be to monitor internal compliance with the regulations. But we're going to look at the DPO in a little bit more detail um, now shortly. The next one then is transparency. So Article 12 of the regulation states the controller shall take appropriate measures to provide any information relating to processing to the data subject in a concise, transparent, intelligible and easily accessible form using clear and plain language. Um, in particular for any information addressed specifically to a child. So at the time when personal data is being obtained, the data subject must be provided with information like who the data controller is or who the data protection officer is, what the legal basis is for processing it, if any of the data has been shared, whether it be internally or externally, what the storage or the transfer of any of that data is, the retention periods, the new and enhanced rights that come with GDPR for the data subjects, whether or not consent is applicable in any stage, and what the breach reporting methods are going to be, if any automated decision making is going to be taking effect with the processing, and whether or not any special categories are processed. So whether or not you record anything like racial or ethnic origin, or if they're a member of a trade union membership. So all that information should be provided to the data subject via a privacy notice or a privacy policy. Um, and we'll look a little later on at how our HR software, Bright Contracts, will help you with that. The other thing that um, GDPR differentiates then from previous legislation is that it introduces a duty on organisations to report breaches. Um, so to the relevant supervisory authority, or the ICO in this case, um, and in some cases to the individuals. So a personal data breach can be broadly defined as a security in incident that affects the confidentiality, the integrity, or the availability of personal data. And where the breach is likely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals, it needs to be reported to the supervisory authority or the ICO. And um, you know, so if something is going to result in the discrimination, or the damage to reputation, financial loss to a data subject, um, but the, it, that will be assessed on a case by case basis. Breaches then are, that are likely to result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of an individual must be reported to the individuals themselves. And um, the high risk means that the threshold for notifying individuals is actually higher than that for notifying the relevant supervisory authority. And you've got 72 hours 
and um, from the point of becoming aware of the breach to report it. Um, and failure to report the breach when required can actually result in an additional fine as well as the fine for the breach itself. Um, your data protection officer. So in some cases, it may be mandatory to appoint a DPO. So for the likes of public bodies or organizations engaged in large scale systematic monitoring of, of personal data, organizations whose core activities consist of processing special categories, um, and there may be mandatory you know, contexts um, that can be defined by the member states themselves. Okay, these are only kind of um, the stipulations under the GDPR, but the member states can actually decide themselves if there's other mandatory sections in that too. The DPO, just to be aware, should really have some expert knowledge of data protection law. So for many companies, it's unlikely that they're going to have that kind of skill set amongst the current staff. So you might be looking at kind of looking outside um, and recruiting outside the company. Your fines then. So organizations can be fined up to 4% of annual global turnover for breaching GDPR or 20 million euro, whichever is the highest. So it's important to note that these rules apply to both controllers and processors. So if you're a payroll bureau, um, you know, processors could be liable for those fines as well. So just bear that in mind. Um, there is as well now this time the option for individuals to take data controllers and processors to court and they can claim compensation for material loss and non-material damage. So that means compensation for distress, hurt feelings, reputational damage, even if there's no proven financial loss. So if you do have a GDPR breach on top of the very substantial fines, and um, you could actually face a civil case as well with additional fines on top of that. But it is believed that you know the fines under GDPR are going to be proportionate and may not be issued in case of every infringement. Um, but really what you're looking at is to be able to demonstrate accountability um, and to demonstrate that you've taken those steps um, towards compliance and then obviously the fines will be mitigated as well. But if you've buried your head in the sand and done nothing, uh, they're not going to look very kindly on that. Okay. Okay, changes to the consent rule. So if you're relying on consent in order to process data, you need to be aware that there's now elevated thresholds in relation to consent. So in terms of your business, you may need to rely on consent for marketing material, um, like if you send out a company newsletter, things like that. But just in relation to those changes, cons consent has to be specific, informed, unambiguous, and freely given, okay? Um, it has to, the text in any consent document must be clearly distinguished from anything else and evidence needs to be retained as to how the consent was obtained. It has to be accessible and easily understood. Okay, so the four particulars there. And just because somebody is a customer, it doesn't mean that you can automatically add them to your mailing list to tell them about every special offer you have. They have to have opted in to your mailing list. And again, this is something that we would have covered in more detail um, in our in our GDPR specific webinars that are on the website. I want to look at then um, the enhanced, the new and enhanced rights under the GDPR. And um, so very quickly, because we're going to concentrate on three of them a little further down the line, but these are what are in the GDPR legislation at the moment. So the right to be informed, um, and this emphasizes the need to be transparent and you have to be clear with your data subject as to what you're doing with their data. The right of access. So the data subject has the right to access to request access to what information you hold on them. The right to rectification. So individuals are entitled to have personal data rectified if it is deemed to be inaccurate or, in, or incomplete. Um, the right to erasure. Um, so the broad principle here is that it, the individual has the right to request deletion or removal of personal data if there's no compelling reason for you to retain it. The right to restrict processing, uh, the right to data portability, and that's more commonly used in the likes of banking. So if you're moving from one banking provider to the next. Um, the right to object. Um, so again, usually got to do with marketing purposes, they have the right to object to that if they don't want them, you're using your details. And then rights in relation to automated decision making. Um, you know, so if you do have any automated processing, um, the individuals have got the right to obtain human intervention um, or obtain an explanation as to what the decision was. All right. 
So that's your, your, your information in relation to GDPR and kind of the differences between the new legislation and what was there previously. Um, so we've just highlighted a couple of those points. What we want to look at now is processing your employee data under GDPR. Okay. So obviously, you know, the information that employers are going to hold on employees is huge. You're going to have information there from the get-go from when the employees first started working with you or even when you started interviewing them so the recruitment process and um, information on your current employees so obviously their bank details payroll information you could have performance reviews and um, sick notes things like that and um, and then obviously you, you're going to have information on employees that may have left your organization so previous employees as well a lot of that information is going to be held more than likely on hard copy personnel files it could be in soft copy, you know, like your payroll system, uh, clock in technologies, or even emails. So what you're going to need to remember is that regardless of how you store your employee personnel, personal data, all of the same concepts that we've discussed in relation to transparency and accountability still apply to it. Okay, so whether it's in, in hard copy or soft copy, you still have to abide by the new GDPR regulations. In terms of being able to demonstrate compliance, one of the core considerations when processing the payroll and personal data is that it must be processed lawfully, fairly and in a transparent manner. So the law for processing, one of the six criteria must be met. We're going to look at that now next. Um, the employee's data has to be kept up to date and can only be used for what the employee was communicated with originally. You only hold the information for as long as it's needed. And it's a question that comes up quite a lot in relation to the retention periods. Your statutory retention periods are always going to, you know, kind of outweigh everything else. And then finally, you must ensure that all data is stored and processed in a secure manner. Okay. So looking at your lawful processing, the processing of personal data can only be deemed as lawful if it meets one or more of the six legal reasons as set out by GDPR. So the first one there is that the data subject has given you consent. OK, again, we're going to look at that now shortly as well. And um, if it's necessary for the performance of a contract or to take steps prior to entering into a contract, if it's necessary for the compliance with legal obligation to which the controller is subject, if it's in order to protect the vital interests of a person, if it's necessary for the public interest or official authority, and that's more than likely going to be dealing with, you know, more public sector bodies or, um, you know, the, the, the police, things like that. And then finally, for the legitimate interests of the data controller um, or yourself, the employer in this case. And this is kind of where you can have a little bit more flexibility in classifying what your processing is actually on. Um, so employee consent, it's, it's no longer permissible under GDPR. So employers really do need to look at some of the other grounds for lawful processing in order to justify why they're processing HR and payroll data. And more than likely, it's going to be down to it being necessary for the performance of a contract, i.e. you're going to have a contract of employment in place. Um, it's going to be to comply with legal obligation. So obviously you have to process payroll information because legally you're obliged to pay an individual and deduct and pay for the, the taxes. And then finally, it could be for the legitimate interests of the business to do so. Um, you know, I, the business is going to have to keep records in relation to HR and performance reviews, things like that. So employers need to give thought to kind of each separate piece of employee data that you, you, you process, i.e. your payroll, uh, HR information, etc. Um, and record what grounds that you believe you have for the law for processing and what they're going to rely on for each of those cases. OK, so we just touched on, on consent there and, and it not really being permissible anymore when it comes to processing employee data. So up until May of this year, one of the more commonly relied upon grounds for law for processing of HR data was that it was done with employee consent. However, as we've already mentioned in the GDPR breakdown, consent has to be freely given, specific, informed and unambiguous. And realistically, given the imbalance of power between the employees and the employer, um, it is going to be difficult for consent to be freely given, which means it's unlikely to provide a valid basis for processing HR data going forward. Um, and historically, there might have been a data protection clause in the contract um, that said employees gave the, the consent to the employer to process the data. Um, and a standard employment contract will certainly be insufficient now going forward and is not going to provide a fallback justification 
for processing that data anymore. So we touched on the new and enhanced rights for the employees. Um, but from the perspective of the rights of employees that you as an employer or a data controller may come across um, and really need to be prepared for are these three. So the right to be informed. This emphasizes the need for transparency in how you use the personal data of a data subject. You have to be very clear with them about how their data is being processed. So you have to provide individuals with information, including your purposes for processing the personal data, what your retention periods for that data is, who it's going to be shared with, what security measures are in place, things like that. So that's called a privacy notice or a privacy policy. Um, the second one there is the right of access. So more commonly referred to as data subject access request. This gives the employees the right to obtain a copy of their personal data, as well as any other supplementary information that you might have on them. Um, and a self-service option is, is a recommendation under GDPR. Now, Rachel's going to show you our self-service option, Brightway Connect, in more detail shortly. Um, and then the third one then is the right to rectification. So Article 16 of the GDPR states individuals have the right to have inaccurate personal data rectified. So an individual may also be able to have incomplete personal data um, you know, fixed or amended as well. So they're the three that you're more than likely going to come across in relation to um, GDPR and the payroll processing. So the recommended uh, self-service options, Ari, um, again, looking at the concept of transparency and the data subjects having easy access to the data that you hold on them, the GDPR includes a best practice recommendation for businesses to provide individuals with a secure self-service platform, which offers remote access to the employees to the information that's held on them. Um, so an employee self-service system is usually an online service that provides employees with access to their personal records, like their contracts of employment, um, their working calendar, pay slips, um, things like that. So different systems are going to have different features, but often employees will also or should also be able to submit leave requests through the service. So there's a, there's a huge kind of um, aspect of administration that's enabled on these kind of self-secure self-secure uh secure self-service platforms and um, so for employers looking to implement best practice measures with regard to gdpr it certainly would be prudent to at least consider the possibility of having an employee and um, self-service facility implemented um, I'm aware that I'm doing a lot of talking, so <laughs> I hope you're all keeping up with me and you haven't got too bored of me at this stage. Rachel will be taking over now shortly. Um, but just moving on uh, very quickly to a few specific payroll processing points that we want to look at. Um, so the distribution of pay slips, this is an area we, where we do still get quite a lot of questions. Um, so in relation to emailing from pay slips. There's nothing in the GDPR legislation that says it's no longer permissible to email them. But what you do need to do is take steps to secure, to securely protect each employee's pay slips. Um, so the likes of password protection um, and a password protection, you know, and again, this is something that comes up. It should be a password that is chosen by the employee. Um, you know, a generic or identical password used for all employees could actually be seen as not taking sufficient steps to offer the most secure environment. And um, so bear that in mind, it really should be the employee that actually decides on the, the password themselves. Um, your payroll provider should provide secure encryption on all the pay slips um, and then automatically delete pay slips that are being sent from their secure location. So you need to check with your provider um, to be certain that they are offering you know, the, the best level of protection for you. And if not, you should be looking at another payroll provider who is offering the maximum. Um, for maximum security, it is recommended, but not mandatory to offer that self-service, um, secure self-service portal. Um, and that way you, you can send and store pay slips and other sensitive payroll documents, and they're all located in the cloud, which is obviously hugely secure. Um, the same applies to the posting of pay slips. So you can still post them. There's, again, there's nothing in the legislation which states that you can't, but you have to be seen to take all appropriate technical and organizational security measures to protect it. And that could be like using security pay slips, marking the envelope as private and confidential, or even using registered post. And um, again, 
the, the alternative to posting is, is to go with that secure self-service option as well. <clears throat> okay, so just touching on that then, this, the self-service portal does offer significant benefits for data controllers and processors to comply with the GDPR legislation. And um, the remote access will provide you and employees with direct access to the payroll information anywhere and anytime. So obviously they're gonna be able to log in 24 seven via the app on their phone or their iPad or whatever it is. And um, you know, the employee's pay slips can be viewed, the leave requests, all the HR documents, amounts due to HMRC, you know, and various other reports. So the employers will also benefit because they can automate then the, dis the distribution of pay slips. Um, a portal that is directly integrated with the payroll is obviously going to allow for the pay slips to automatically be available as soon as the payroll is finalized. Um, and this offers additional security against cyber attacks and eliminates email hacks that could occur when sending and receiving pay slips um, or reports by email. So additionally, that self-service option allows businesses to keep their data update and accurate as the employees can edit their contact information as well. So you're, you're covering the, the accountability, the transparency there too. So when it comes to the payroll data, the businesses should be looking at a password protection on the computers and any other devices that hold personal payroll data. So the machine that has the payroll software on. Um, the payroll software itself should have a password protection on it, um, you know, in case somebody is using the machine that has the payroll on it. Um, pay slips, that we've already discussed, has the password protection or the security envelopes if you're posting. And having a simple measure like having a, a clean desk policy in place, making sure any timesheets or payroll documents are, are secured, you know, or stored and secured in a, in a cabinet or a lockable folder. Um, and even the likes of having like a shredding box beside your printers and having some kind of policy in place that they're emptied once a week or at the end of each day, whatever it is. Okay. Your data processor agreement then. So the GDPR places increased responsibilities on all parties that process personal data. So in this section, I want to look at the responsibilities of those who process employee payroll data. And that can obviously vary from the employer and the accountant of the employer, um, or possibly you have your, your payroll outsourced to a payroll bureau. So we're gonna look at those. So the data processing, where business processes their own payroll in-house, they're both the data controllers and the data processor. Where a business outsources the payroll to an accountant or a payroll bureau, the bureau is the data processor and the employer is the data controller. The payroll data processor can lawfully process data on behalf of a client as long as there is a written contract between the payroll bureau and the client. The data processors must only process data as per the written instruction of the client. So it is of the utmost importance that a comprehensive contract is in place. Um, and we'll come back to the contract now in a second. Um, the final point here is that if the employees in the outsourced payroll situation we do get asked quite a lot whether payroll bureaus need written consent from their clients employees in order to process the payroll and the answer here is no and um, but again you do need to make sure that the employees have been made aware and have been clearly informed that the payroll is being processed or outsourced and um, to a third party so the contract is important so your data processor agreement it's important so that both parties understand what the responsibilities and liabilities are. Controllers are liable for their compliance with GDPR and must only appoint processors who can provide sufficient guarantees that the requirements of the GDPR are going to be met and the rights of the data subject are protected. So really the onus is on the employer here to ensure that the correct contract is in place with their payroll bureau. Um, and although the onus is on the data controller to ensure the contracts are in place, and um, if you are the payroll bureau, it would certainly be our advice that when it comes to GDPR, you should aim to take an active role in educating your clients about those new regulations. Um, and it would be our advice that, you know, if your clients haven't contacted you, you might consider actually approaching them with regard to putting a data processor agreement or a DPA in place. Um, data processors are going to have some direct responsibilities under the GDPR and they may also be subject to fines or other sanctions if they don't comply so it's not that, like they're going to be let off scot-free either 
Um, so to comply with the new regulations, the payroll bureaus have two options. You can either draft new terms of service or end user license agreements or engagement letters, whatever you might have, for each of your clients to include those new GDPR requirements. Or where there's already an existing contract or letter of engagement in place, you can issue an addendum to the contract, which will cover the new GDPR requirements. So this is commonly known as the data processor agreement or the DPA. So the mandatory content that must be included in the contract has been expanded and is a lot there's a lot more detail around the data protection responsibilities and liabilities of both the controller and the processor. Um, <laughs> excuse me. And they include the likes of confirmation of security, confidentiality, and details of any sub-processor that's going to be used. Um, so to assist with our customers, we have created a template DPA or data processor agreement, which can be used as an addendum to any existing contracts that you might have. Um, and this can be downloaded in the handout section um, or it can be included, it will be included in the webinar follow-up email, which will be sent out a little later on today. Okay, so <clears throat> how can BrightPay help? Okay. Um, BrightPay offers a suite of products that have been updated to assist you with your GDPR compliance. Um, I'm going to take you on a very quick tour of the employee privacy policy that we've created in our HR software Bright contracts. And then Rachel is going to finally take over <laughs> and show you our self-service facility. So the recommended self-service portal, um, BrightPay Connect. So very quickly, how can Bright Contracts help with your GDPR compliance? So Bright Contracts allows the user to create and manage legally compliant employment contracts, customizable staff handbooks with all the required and recommended policies from an employment law perspective. Um, having your employee contracts and other personal data like the privacy policies in the program, which has built in encryption and security measures means the employer is demonstrating compliance with the GDPR regulations around the security of that data. So your accountability straight away is being ticked off. So we've already mentioned in the transparency requirements, GDPR stipulates anywhere personal data is being collected, whether it be directly or indirectly, privacy notices should be in place. And these notices are critical to complying with the transparency obligations of the GDPR. One of the main principles of GDPR that we've already touched on is that the data should be processed lawfully, fairly and in a transparent manner. Those three elements kind of overlap and really need to be satisfied together in order to demonstrate compliance. Um, employers, as we've seen, are both data controllers and processors in some cases, and they have to be able to show how they comply with the new data protection principles and be clear and open with their employees about the data that they process and what the employee rights are. So what we've done in Bright Contracts is we've taken away the headache with the introduction of an employee privacy policy. The policy will cover all those required elements and ensure demonstrable demonstrable compliance in regard to the employer's obligations that are required under GDPR. So I'm just going to very quickly show you the actual privacy policy on Bright Contracts itself. Um, so to upgrade the software, we released an upgrade in May that includes this new privacy policy feature. So employers can now facilitate that main GDPR principle of the transparent processing of the employee data. It's literally, you know, kind of with the click of a couple of buttons, the employer has to select two compulsory sections. So anything in relation to whether automated decision making occurs in relation to the data. So that could be whether or not you have a system in place that automatically selects possible job applicants from a database. And then the second one then is whether or not any of the data is transferred outside of the European economic area for specific or for storage purposes even. Once you have those two compulsory sections selected, then you can set specific sections that are, you know, specific to your own organization requirements. And um, the system will then generate a compliant employee privacy policy indicating everything that we covered there when we looked at the transparency, what data has been processed, how it was collected, who it's been shared with, whether there's any third parties like an accountant or pension provider, what your retention periods are, the rights of the individual. So like those we looked at, the right to access, the right to rectification. So the privacy policy is critical to comply with those transparency obligations. So it is vital that you have the correct and appropriate information included, and it is presented in a clear and understandable format. 
So again, by contracts has done all that for you. And with the couple of clicks of the mouse, we'll generate that policy for you, enabling the employer to tick off another box in relation to GDPR compliance. Um, so it is a requirement for the employer to provide the employees with details, like what, where, and how, in relation to their personal data. Um, however, the employees should also make themselves aware of the data protection policy within the handbook, which we also update in relation to the GDPR regulations. Um, and this is a guide for the employees in matters like breach reporting, who they should go to within the organization to report a complaint or a breach to. Um, so there's more information, obviously, on our, on our website, brightcontracts.co.uk. Um, you can also request a free online demo um, in the questionnaire at the end of the webinar. Um, so that's the policy. So I'm going to give you a break from listening to me now. I've you know, rattled on for long enough. So I'm going to pass you on to Rachel, who's going to look at our self-service facility, Bright Bay Connect now. Thanks, Jenny. I think you're delighted to have a break from talking. Oh, I need to cough now. <laughs> So looking now at BrightPay Connect, which is an optional add-on product that works alongside BrightPay. BrightPay Connect is tailored to help you overcome some of the key challenges GDPR presents when processing payroll. Essentially, BrightPay Connect is an automated cloud backup, keeping employees' payroll data safe and secure. The payroll itself is still processed on BrightPay's desktop application, However, the payroll information is stored online on a secure cloud server. Because the payroll information is stored online, it has allowed us to bring you even more benefits to help you with GDPR compliance. So here we have BrightPay payroll software, and at the top corner of the screen, you can access BrightPay Connect. So with the GDPR, it is important to keep a copy of payroll files safe in case of fire, theft, damaged computers, or even cyber attacks. BrightPay Connect will automatically back up your data every 15 minutes when the payroll is open, and again when you close down the employer file. BrightPay Connect will keep a chronological history of all backups, which can be downloaded and restored again at any time. Since the payroll data is stored online with BrightPay Connect, you can invite employees to their own password protected self service portal. If you're a payroll bureau, you can also invite your clients to their own online employer dashboard. Employers and employees can log in 24-7 on any device, including PCs, Macs, tablets and smartphones, essentially anywhere that you have access to an internet browser. This fulfills the GDPR recommendation to provide remote access to a secure system where employees would have direct access to their personal data held. So here on the screen, we have the employer dashboard, and this, this is what the online portal looks like for businesses processing their own payroll in-house, and it is also what it looks like for both payroll bureaus and their clients. In the Employees tab, employers can access pay slips and payroll documents for each of their employees. These documents will automatically be available to employers on BrightPay Connect as soon as the payroll is finalised. The next tab is reports, and here employers can log in any time and run their own payroll reports. Again, as soon as the payroll is finalised, any report that is saved in the payroll software will automatically be available on BrightPay Connect to both employers and payroll clients. For payroll bureaus, this eliminates the need to email reports to clients each pay period. Next up, we have Calendar, which is a company-wide employee calendar. Employers can view past and scheduled leave for all employees, including annual leave, unpaid leave, sick leave, and parenting leave. Within HMRC payments, employers can view amounts due to HMRC, and employers can also click into the individual months uh, to view a full breakdown of the P30. Next is documents, and here employers can upload sensitive HR documents and confidential employee information. Employers can upload documents that apply to all employees, such as a company handbook or a privacy policy, documents that are unique to individual employees, so for example, a contract of employment, or even documents that are relevant to a particular department. So let's say training documents, for example. It also goes one step further, and rather than just a document upload, you may also decide to add a hyperlink or notes instead. 
and this will allow the employer to use it as a company notice board with email notifications to employees. The final tab then is settings and here employers can add their company logo which employees will see on the login screen. There are other self-service settings available here also. So for example, the employer may decide to turn off the ability for employees to request leave through the portal. So far, everything we have seen is visible to employers, payroll bureaus and payroll clients. However, payroll bureaus can go one step further where they have an additional layer of information available. Here, the Bureau has an overview of multiple employers where they can view each of their clients within the one account. They also have the ability to set up users. So you may add an administrator who has high level access to all information or a standard user who would have access to one or multiple employer files. For a standard user, you can set up user restrictions. Going back to GDPR and what Jenny said earlier, privacy by default means that you should only have access to the information needed to complete the necessary tasks. So here we may have a HR manager who should have access to the employee calendar and approve leave requests. On the other hand, there may be a payroll administrator that should not have access to employee documents or employees marked as confidential. The next tab here is requests, which is available to bureaus. Here, bureaus have the ability to request employee payments from their client and request client approval for the payroll run. Um, looking at the attendee list for today, I, can't, I do see there is a lot of bureaus on today, so I am going to come back to this section at the end of the demo. Finally then, payroll bureaus can add their own bureau branding. So for the client, it looks like they're logging into a portal that is unique to your practice. Moving on now to the third and final user, the individual employee. And as mentioned earlier, they can log in remotely to a self-service portal as recommended under the GDPR. Employees can log in using the self-service portal on any internet browser, or there is also a smartphone app where employees can log in and get notifications directly to their device. Similar to the employer dashboard, employees will have an overview screen with notifications of payslips and various documents, an overview of personal information and upcoming calendar events. The employee can click into documents to view a full library of all payslips and other payroll documents, such as P60s, P45s and even auto enrollment communications. The employee can access each individual payslip and download them if needed. So for example, if they're applying for a loan. Going back into the documents then again, the employee can go into HR documents and resources. And here they can view HR and other employee documents that have been uploaded by their employer, such as their contract of employment. Employees also have the ability to update basic personal details, such as their phone number and postal address. The right to rectification of personal data held is an important employee right under the GDPR. And this feature also helps with the requirement to have up-to-date and accurate information. The final tab available to employees then is calendar. And here employees can access an overview of all past and scheduled leave. Here, they can also request leave instantly. So, so they simply choose the date, the type of leave, whether it's a full day or half day and click submit. Now the employer or HR manager who is selected to approve the leave will get an automated email to say that the employee has requested leave. And moving back again to the employer dashboard, we can see the notification for the leave request and we can approve or reject the leave. Once approved, the leave will then automatically sync back to each of the accounts in real time. So it will appear on the employer calendar and the employee calendars, and it will also automatically sync back to Brightpay payroll software on your desktop. So just to summarize the key GDPR points covered by Brightpay Connect then, Brightpay Connect allows you to keep employee payroll data safe and secure. It enables you to offer self-service remote access to employees as recommended by the GDPR. For bureaus, it introduces a self-service portal for client communications, eliminating the need to send documents with sensitive personal information by email. 
Brightpay Connect gives the ability to employees to update their own personal information. Users can be set up so that they only have access to information needed to complete their duties, ensuring privacy by default. And finally, Brightpick Connect acts as an all-in-one central location to store all things employee-related, including payroll, HR, and other employment-related documents. Essentially, by introducing Brightpick Connect in your business, you will be taking steps to be GDPR compliant. Before I finish up, I just want to very quickly go back to the requests feature. This feature is only available to bureaus, so if you're an employer, just bear with me for a few minutes. This is a new feature coming very soon to Brightpay Connect, which is why I want to show it to you all on today's webinar. Bureaus will be able to send payroll entry requests and payroll approval requests to their clients. First, looking at the payroll entry request, step one is to select the employer and the user for that employer that you wish to send the request to. Next, select the pay period and the employees you wish to include in the request and then click Submit to send the request to the client. I'm now going to switch over to the client's login where we can view what the request will look like for the client. So we are now acting as the payroll client and here we see a request in our, new, in our notifications to submit the payroll information. The employer has a list of their employees and we can click into each employee to enter the payroll data. So here I have added 39 hours for this employee and it has also picked up the employee's £10 hourly rate that is set up on Brightpay for the employee. We can also break down payments by departments. So if an employee is, dis is assigned to more than one department in Brightpay, your client will be able to associate these payments for the employee with the various departments. We also have the option to add other payments. So here we can add weekly, hourly, and daily pay. Um, so I've chosen a daily rate there, and we see 85 pounds per day is the rate that is automatically picked up by Bright Bay Connect from the payroll software. Um, I'm going to say that this payment is for overtime where the employee is due to be paid time and a half. And I'm going to say that this payment is associated with the marketing department. Moving further down the screen then, uh, we can also add additions and deductions for the employee for this pay period. Similar to the pay rates, any addition and deduction set up in Brightpay can be added to the employee's pay slip. So here we can add an expense reimbursement. So I'm going to say it's £20 in the marketing department. Um, again, we can do the same with deductions. And we also have the option to add one-off auto enrollment employer or employee pension contributions. Once we're finished, we can mark the employee as completed. And we can also see this on the overview screen on the list of employees. So to save time today, I'm just going to quickly mark all of the employees as completed. Um, moving down to the bottom of the page, we can now say that we're finished with the request, or we can add any comments to communicate with the payroll bureau, or we can also add a new starter for the pay period. So I'm just going to say I'm finished in this case. And now the payment information is sent back to the payroll bureau. Moving back to the bureau screens again, we can see an additional entry in the response received section. The Bureau can click into the payroll entry response and view the information that has been entered by the client. They can also go into each individual employee to have a look at the information entered. Once reviewed, the Bureau can say that all looks good or if we feel there is something not right, we can resend the request back to the client. Now that the payroll entry has been approved by the Bureau, we now see a new section on our screen with payroll entry requests that are ready to download to Brightpay. So I'm going to switch back to the payroll software now. Opening the payroll software, we see that Brightpay looks a bit different, including a new requests button and notifications. On this not or requests dropdown, we have the payroll entry request that is ready to download to Brightpay. Or here the Bureau can also create new payroll entry requests and new payroll approval requests. So I'm going to download the payroll entry. And the information that was included in the request has now been downloaded and applied to the relevant employees. 
Going into Jemima, we will see the payment details that we entered as the client are now appearing in her pay record. So we have our 39 admin hours, one day time and a half with marketing, and we also have our £20 expense reimbursement. At this point, the next step is usually to finalise the payroll. However, payroll bureaus have an other option that they can do if they wish to do so. Going back into the requests button again, the Bureau can send a payroll approval request to their client. Essentially, this will allow the Bureau to send the payroll summary to the client for approval before the payroll is finalised. Again, we will submit this request to the client. And now the client will get an email notification of the request. I can imagine the payroll bureaus are going to like that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we're going to switch back to the client dashboard one last time and I hope going between these users isn't confusing me too much. We now have a new request to approve the payroll in the notifications. Here the client can review the payroll and give final approval at the click of a button. Back in the payroll software, the Bureau now has alerts again um, on the pay period and notifying them that a new request has been received. So clicking on the request button again, it is telling us that uh, we need to acknowledge that we have received the file. So I can simply click acknowledge here and just, sorry, let the, just keep track that we have finalized this payroll run. So I'm gonna take a break for a second, <laughs> sorry, Jen. Very good, well, definitely see a lot of payroll bureaus are going to like that last option there certainly in relation to the getting the approval from the client definitely because um, yeah. it means then you don't have to have it finalized before you send them there and the as report. well it does keep an audit trail there sorry come back to the last slide there just yeah. to show you it does keep an audit trail of the request so oh, for the bureau they can see um which user has approved the payroll any changes that have been made so the bureau is covered Absolutely, on all yeah. points so of view. If, if the client comes back and said, I never get that email, you can actually see it from exactly. the Exactly, we have the date and time that it's been done there. Oh, brilliant, excellent. That's great, well, thanks very much, Rachel. Um, so very briefly, just before we finish up, we just want to take a quick look at how the source has prepared for um, GDPR. Um, obviously, data protection has always been a concern for us, for us um, and we've always aimed to act with complete integrity in that regard. So like all companies in preparation for GDPR, we had to complete a total review on how you know, we gathered, maintained and use our data. So in relation to our software products, we are 100% committed to the data by design and um, security is at the center of everything that we do. BrightBay itself is a desktop application that sits on your computer. So we do not have access to any of your data files. So unless you've actually submitted um, you know, a company data file for support reasons, we have no control over the authority, uh, the safety or the quality of the data that you input. You and you alone are responsible for the accuracy and completeness of those records. Um, and whilst we do have security measures in place to protect your data, it does still remain your responsibility to keep the likes of your sign-in details confidential and to make sure to close down um, BrightPay on your PC when you're actually not when you're not using it anymore. Um, excuse me, and to protect your information, you will need to ensure that there's no unauthorized access to your machine um, and to make sure that your software is password protected. Some of the key changes that we have made, um, so obviously from time to time when we assist with um, a client's query, we may request a backup or a copy of the company data file to fully resolve the query. So whilst we did have security protocols in place for this, we did feel that we could make them even more secure. So we've created an in-program support feature that allows users to automatically send us that company data file through the secure channel. So in the help menu of BrightPay, you have an option now to contact customer support. Um, you can select who you might have spoken to on the phone if they've requested your snapshot. And then there's basically just a tick option for, for you to include the company data file and that comes straight into us. Um, so that feature means you don't have to upload the backup to any emails and then forget to delete it at a later stage. The backup when we get it here is saved on, uh, it's not saved on the support assistance machine or any emails. Uh, the backups that we receive are all saved centrally on a secure server and they're automatically deleted after 72 hours. 
We've updated our privacy policy to accommodate the new data protection responsibilities. Um, the new privacy policy explains how we use your data, who we share it with, and how long we're going to keep it for. Um, now, we've worked really hard on this. Um, so this updated policy is really detailed, um, but it is very easy to understand. So certainly have a look at that on our website. Um, over the last 12 months, we've completed internal IT audits on all of our company PCs. So securely deleting any unnecessary files. And then going forward, we, ha we have a plan in place or a policy in place that we will conduct regular audits and keep track of the GDPR compliance to ensure that we're not retaining any unnecessary data. We were looking as well at how information is sent to and retrieved from our secure service. So be it for the purposes of maintaining our websites or our CRM system. So we've now changed all of our servers over to a more secure Microsoft Azure servers. And we've also introduced um, this IP whitelisting. That means that knowing the login credentials is no longer going to be enough. The request must come from a trusted IP location. We've introduced additional consent fields on different areas of the software and the websites. And these consent forms are explicitly requesting consent to sign up to newsletters, um, which will contain information about webinars, special offers, legislation changes. Um, the users can obviously unsubscribe very easily at any time. And with the exception of essential software updates, customers will not be contacted unless they've specifically opted into those mailing lists. Now, obviously, we all think here that the newsletters and webinars are extremely informative and very useful for all of our customers. So we would certainly recommend that you do sign up if you haven't already done so. And um, so if you do wish to subscribe, uh, you can do that on the survey after today's webinar um, and in the follow up email or on the Brightpay and Source websites as well. And then finally, we did run a number of training sessions with our staff so everybody understands the implications of the GDPR legislation. Um, and going forward, we will continue to hold in-house training you know, on an ad hoc basis and update sessions to ensure that our staff are fully aware of the new legislation and how it's impacting their role going forward too. So that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Um, we are going to go into our, our Q&A session now. Um, so if you do have any questions, feel free to type them into the questions bar. We will try and get through as many questions as possible. I see there are quite a few there already. So if we don't get to you, um, you know, don't be dismayed. But we do tend to find the Q&A session is very um, informative. A lot of people do um, enjoy hearing other people's uh, feedback. Will I move to the next one? No. Um, okay, so there's a few questions coming in here again, and there is someone asking there uh, where they entered the questions. Um, so just on the control panel at the right of your screen, where you actually typed in, you can't see any question box, you just type it in there and we will read them out. Um, okay, so the first question here, do employers have to register with ICO as well as comply with the GDPR? Um, yeah, this is a question that has come up previously. Um, the ICO, as far as I know, yes, you do still have to register with them. Um, the GDPR is, is a piece of legislation. Um, regardless of whether or not you're, you're registered or signed up with the ICO, you're going to have to comply with the regulations. Um, but the ICO is a really very informative body. It's, it's the um, Information Commissioner's Office um, and they do have a wealth of information on the website and actually myself and, and my colleague Laura have used it, used them and contacted them on a, re on a regular basis. Um, but as far as I'm aware, yes, you do still need to register your organisation with them um, and GDPR will comply, will apply regardless of whether or not you are with them or not. Perfect. Um, in the case where you're emailing all payslips to one person within the company, i.e. their internal pay secretary or directors, is it okay to send all payslips with the same password and allow the distribution to individual employees from the client side? Okay, so this is where the payslips are going to an individual and the client, and then the client are going to send them to the employees directly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously you're the data processor here. The employer is the data controller. Um, the responsibility is lying with both parties, um, really, in, in, in relation to the security of the payslips. And I suppose once there is security in place, um, 
I don't see the issue with that, but I suppose it would be up to the employer to ensure then that once they're going out from their side, um, that they are being sent with a, a separate password protection facility on it. Okay, and um, there is a second question from someone else here as well that's kind of sim similar. I have a situation I am curious about. If a company does payroll for a client and ask them for the option for them to password protect the information due to GDPR and the client declines, who would be at fault if the company ac accidentally sends the payroll information elsewhere? Is the company responsible and can their accidental mistake be taken further even though it was the client the client's warrant? I suppose from the payroll bureau perspective, once you have a record of the recommendation of the password protection being given to them and you having that on file that they declined it, you've got yourself covered. As to who is responsible and who is not responsible in relation to um, the pay slips being sent to the wrong people, um, you know, that that's going to be dealt with on a, on a case by case basis. But once you keep that record there of the, the them declining, put the password protection on it, you're, you're covered. In that okay, regard. that's useful to know. Okay, the next question here now. Um, we're doing the payroll for our clients. Uh, we have their consent to act for them and under the GDPR keep their records. I understand that the employer does not need to get their consent of the employees, but they should inform the employees. If the employee requests to view their records, who is responsible to provide access to the personal records, our clients or us, the payroll bureau? Well, generally, um, the employee is going to go to their employer to request access to their data. So if you are a third party, i.e. the payroll bureau, so the, the, cost, the employer is using you to process their payroll, they're going to contact you in relation to getting the personal data that you have on file belonging to the employee. But, you know, that's only relation to your payroll. That employer is going to have a huge amount more information um, on that employee in relation to, you know, when they started out their, their CV and the recruitment process, they're going to have documents in relation to HR, performance reviews, um, doctor certs if they're out sick at any point. So um, if you process the payroll, certainly you're going to have to provide the information back to the employer as to the personal data you have on file for them, but the employer is going to have to provide a lot more. Um, and this question does come up a bit as well. If a data subject requests access to their personal data, um, it would be prudent of the employer or the data controller to, to ask well, what, what data are they actually looking for. Um, instead of having to go through the whole rigmarole and the hassle of going through every little piece of information, the employee might actually only be looking for information on HR information that you hold on them um, or payroll information. So ask the question, you know, and don't be frightened to ask the question as to what it is they're looking for. And it could help eliminate a huge amount of time, um, you know, for you in relation to getting that detail to them. Okay. Um Next question here, can an employer add employee pay details directly into payroll, Bright Pay Connect rather than sending on Excel sheets with their pay and then we add into Bright Pay Connect and I see the next question after that is um, the question must have came in before I had shown the client entry side of things and um, so yeah that answers that question. Um, there is also um, a lot of good feedback on that new feature that I showed uh, so it's great to get an initial feedback um, from that, like like I said, it's our first time properly demoing um, that feature in the software. So it's great to have all the wonderful comments. Um, there is a few people um, wondering if it's available now. This is the requests option. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah, I should have read out the question properly. <laughs> um, yeah. So the client entry um, feature will be available very soon. It is in the final status of testing. Um, so yeah, it just depends on how that final stage of testing goes, whether it should be available shortly. Keep an, keep an eye on the websites, or certainly you'll, you know if you've signed up to our mailing lists, uh, you'll get an email as soon as it yeah. is available. I actually um, I've added a question into the survey after the webinar with a tick box. So if you are interested in the Connect, um, it's just um, for us to notify you when it's available. Um, you can just take that option there, and we'll let you know. The next question here, uh, we have mainly part-time staff working different hours from each other and including some who work different hours each day. Can the annual leave system on BrightPay cope with this? 
Thanks. <laughs> if you pay the employees by the hour, as in you have your hourly rate and you're stipulating the number of standard hours or overtime hours that you're doing, and you have the holiday calculation method set to hours worked, the system will calculate um, the percentage for you. Um, if you're paying the employees like a daily rate or you know a weekly or monthly figure, there's no way that the system is going to know how many hours that's been worked. So therefore that, that rule won't won't work in that regard. So it's only if you actually pay them by the hour, the system is then able to calculate the 12.07% um, automatically for you. But again, just make sure that the holiday calculation method is set to by hours worked as opposed to um, set number of days or whatever it is. Okay. Um, is any business allowed to use the addendum supplied here or should it be tailored? Uh, no, absolutely. You're, you're free to use it. Um, it should be tailored, obviously, to suit your own organization's requirements. We've gone with the kind of most best and common practice in relation to what needs to be included. So what you're legally required to include in that DPA is there. Um, but obviously, if there's additional um, content, then you would need to tailor it um, and customize it to your own organization's requirements. But certainly, yeah, feel free to use it. Okay. Um, can I email payslips through Brightpick software when I am outside the EU? I'm traveling to Australia next year and will be processing payroll for several clients while away. Yeah. Again, you would just have to make sure that you have informed your employees that obviously the processing. Um, I think this is a payroll bureau. Um, yeah, so I'm assuming then you're going to be taking your laptop that has the payroll on it yeah. and processing from while you're away. Yeah, it's a case of just informing your clients then, more that um, you're going to be outside of the EU um, and maybe just documenting that. So if it's a case of maybe just sending them an email just to let them know that you know, you're going to be away um, and that you're going to be processing the payroll whilst you're away. Um, like the emailing of the payslips are still coming in through, if you do it through Bikeway, are still coming in through our servers. Um, but I suppose it's the fact that you're just outside of the EU when you're processing them. So I think once you're letting them know, um, and if they have any objections to it, then again, just keep a record of it, and maybe get somebody in the office to do that particular client's payroll from there. Um, but I think it's, it's the information, it's that accountability and that you're going to inform them, you know, before the, the actual fact. OK. Under old data protection rules, if under five employees, there was no need to register with the data protection or ICO, is this still the case with the new GDPR? Uh, GDPR is applicable to everybody. So even if you only have one employee, if you have no employees, um, you're still going to you're still going to have personal data of some level, whether it be belonging to customers, uh, suppliers, you're still going to have a name and address, a phone number belonging to somebody, whether it be written down on a piece of paper in your notebook, it uh, could be on an email from somebody. Once you have that personal data, you have to comply with the GDPR. Um, as to registering with the ICO, um, I'm not aware that you, you didn't if you had under five employees. So um, I'm not entirely sure about that. As far as I know, you do still need to register with them. Um, but you, you might just want to double check that. Um, again, the ICO website is brilliant and it's very easy to, to use. So um, I look into it myself, um, but as far as I know, you do, yeah. Okay. If sending email payslips to personal email addresses, do these need a password? No, you, you don't have to have a password on it. However, um, you do need to be saying to be taken appropriate organizational and technical measures to ensure the security of the, of the data. Um, so password protection is certainly recommended. You have the ability to password protection in BrightPay, so why not use it? Okay. When sending summary sheets in relation to work carried out each month, separate pay slips to personal email addresses, do these need a password? I think that's kind of a follow up to yeah, the from that one, yeah. same one. Um, when completing the new starter paperwork uh, used to upload details onto BrightPay, uh, should there be a sentence or two around consent, including 
included on the document with an employee completing the new starter form? No, no, because again, consent in relation to the employee employer data really is no longer permissible. Um, what you're going to be re relying on there is, is the legal process, the lawful uh, reasons for processing being that the employee is going to be sign, signing up to an employment contract you're going to be signing that employment contract that's an agreement between the two parties so there's your legal reason for processing the data if you don't already have your contract in place then your legal obligation you are agreeing to pay this employee therefore you have to deduct the taxes you have to pay it forward to HMRC there's another reason for it for processing the data so consent is no longer really uh, a law for reason for processing the data so i wouldn't i wouldn't even do that no okay so the bright contracts think to connect uh, with regards to privacy policies being available to clients employees through bright pay connect no it's only bright pay uh, that connects to connect uh, that syncs to connect bright contracts is a standalone product separate to bright pay and connect and um, however if you do have bright contracts and you create the likes of the privacy policy on it you can upload them to the document upload section of the Connect portal, and um, you know, and that along with your a copy of your handbook or your your contracts can all be uploaded and stored uh, securely for the individuals to have access to them at any point. Yeah, I think the next slide kind of shows that a bit better. Um, we have the three products here: um, BrightPay and BrightPay Connect, a full integration, uh, whereas BrightPay and Bright Contracts and BrightPay Bright. Pay, Bright Pay connect and um, write contracts, bit of a mouthful. Yeah. Um, they work alongside each other, but they're not necessarily integrated where um, they automatically sync up. Exactly, exactly. Um, there's just two more questions here. Uh, someone's wondering about the price of Bright Pay Connect and someone's wondering about the price of Bright Contracts. Uh, so I do have a couple more slides here that I wasn't really going to do, but um, just the payroll software, the standard license costs £99 plus VAT per tax year. Um, the bureau license costs £229 plus VAT per tax year. Both in licensing licenses include free phone and email support and full functionality for auto enrollment, CIS, payrolling of benefits, and they also include a payroll journal export to accounting packages such as the likes of Sage and Zero and QuickBooks. Um, we do also have a free license for employers with three or less employees. Um, as for right contracts, then. Oh, sorry, sorry I'm down a bit too much. Uh, looking at bright contracts, the standard license costs £99 plus VAT per tax year. Per year, sorry, per not year. per tax yeah. year. Um, again, it includes unlimited employees. And again, the bureau license is £199 per year. Uh, both licenses include, again, free phone and email support. And customers can also benefit from online HR templates and HR guidance. Finally, then we have BrightPay Connect. Um, it's an add-on to um, BrightPay on your desktop and costs £49 plus VAT per employer per tax year. Uh, we do also offer packages and discounts for bureau users who process their payroll for multiple clients. So prices for these are available on our website or if you want in the survey after today's webinar, just um, in the comment box, uh, just add how many clients you have and we can get back to you with a price for that. If you're interested in all three products, we do have a bundle deal as well. Um, so, for example, all three products together are valued at £247 for a single employer. But when you buy all three together, you can get them for £199. Um, nice. So I think a couple more questions have came in there while we were looking at that. Um, can the client approval feature be used without the client entry feature? So yes, both both of the requests are standalone. It's up to you whether you want to use one of them, both of them, or um, no, none, none of them. them at all. It's totally <laughs> up to yourself. Um, so yeah, you, they can be used as standalone. Um, we are an employer and use BrightPay to run our payroll. Does that mean uh, we are the controller and BrightPay is the processor? Uh, you're the employer and use BrightPay. No, in that case, you are both the controller and the processor. Uh, really, only BrightPay would become a processor if at any stage that you send us a company um, data file um, via the, the support console. Um, you know, and, and even at that, if we're just kind of checking something for you, we're not processing anything. Um, but no, as the employer and you using the payroll software, you are both the controller and the processor. Okay, 
Well, thanks everyone for joining us for today's webinar. That's the end of the questions there. Um, and thanks Jenny for all her hard work on today's webinar as well. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks everybody. I hope I didn't thanks. bore you too much with my, my big lunch spiel. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye everybody.